Well, if you've not been with us over the last weeks, you may not know that we've been working our way through Mark's gospel, and uh, today we're starting a new series as we do that. It's called How to Grow Spiritually. In fact, for the next three weeks, we're going to be in the fourth chapter of Mark's gospel looking at a story that Jesus tells and explains. Just to kind of paint the picture of what's been happening in this gospel is Jesus' ministry was started and miracles were happening and people were coming from everywhere. I mean, so much so the, the gospel tells us that I mean, he, he couldn't go anywhere without just crowds of people coming. And yet he will go off by himself and he'll spend some time with these 12 and he'll appoint them to be his disciples. And they're starting to kind of get a little bit of the idea of who Jesus is. The crowds, though, they just keep coming, and they come for the miracles. They don't really understand the message. And then there's this moment right before this fourth chapter of Mark's gospel where his family come, and they really misunderstand what he's doing. They think he's, he's kind of gone crazy, and they want to take him home to Nazareth. And then in the middle of all of that, the religious leaders show up, and they say he's doing all this stuff by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of demons. They, they just think that... I said this last time that Jesus was just the devil in disguise. And then all of this is happening. All of this activity is happening. I mean, Mark's gospel, the drama is building and building and building and building. And then all of a sudden, the scene changes. And it's almost like a telescope. You know, when you zoom in with the telescope and you just get, all of a sudden, we zoom in on Jesus in this fourth chapter of Mark's gospel. And we go with him beside the water's edge, the Sea of Galilee. He gets into a boat and he begins to just speak to us today. And as he begins to speak, he begins to tell a story. It's a parable. You know, they say that parables are, are earthy stories or earthly stories with heavenly meanings. He, he begins to explain some of the deep spiritual truths of life and why some people get the gospel, why some people become Christians, and why these other people are not. And he starts to do so by telling this particular parable, the parable of the, of the sower. The title of our message today is called So, and I don't mean with a needle and thread, but I mean it in this other way. So if you have a, a Bible you want to follow along, we'll be in Mark 4. To those of you who are joining us online, I want to say welcome to worship on this day. This is the way it starts, verse 1. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat. And so there Jesus is in a boat at the lake, you know, until he's Baptist, you know. And he's, and he's sat in it, it was just kind of interesting as well, he sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. Now, if you don't understand why he's doing this, it's because there's a natural kind of sound event that happens when you're on this particular lake and then all of the shoreline goes up, that the sound reverberates so well off the lake that you can be far away up on the hillside and you can still hear so clearly what Jesus is saying. It's a sort of natural amphitheater effect. And so they're all able to hear and he's there. The crowd is huge. He's there. He's speaking. He's in a boat. And this is what he says. And so we just kind of listen in today. It says in verse 2, he taught them many things by parables. And in his teaching, he said, there's a place in the gospel, over in Luke's gospel, I think it is, where he says that it, Jesus never taught without teaching in parables. A parable, the word parabole means to take something and put it beside something else. We have the word analogy. If you don't know something, then you get an analogy to kind of explain, explain it. In, in math class, I can remember in, in school that the teacher would explain something and give an example, and I didn't understand it until I saw the example, and we may not understand how to grow spiritually until Jesus teaches us a parable about it. And this is what it says he taught, verse 3, he started by saying, listen, listen. A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came, and they ate it up. By the way, um, anybody have a bird feeder? <laughs> right? This is kind of a bird feeder moment. This is the first time in the Bible we see a bird feeder, you know, Jesus' story of the bird feeder. He doesn't know he's feeding the birds. He thinks he's 
going to make crops, but he's feeding the birds. Verse 5, some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. That makes sense. That They wouldn't be able to do much there on the rock, right? It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came out, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no what? Roots. No root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so, so they didn't bear any grain. Some of you probably plant some things along life and some other things grew up around it. And they kind of took it out. (laughs) Verse 8, still other seed fell on, I love how Jesus says this, good soil. Good soil. It came up and 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 it grew and it produced a crop. In fact, not just a crop, but look what it says. Some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. It's a bumper crop. Verse 9, then Jesus said, Kind of how he started, he finishes, he says, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Are we hearing today what Jesus is saying? He's talking about sowing, but he's not talking about farmers. He's talking about how to grow spiritually in your life. And the question I think we need to ask ourselves is, like, what are we sowing into our lives? I mean, parents, what are we sowing into the lives of kids and grandkids and what are, we, what, are we, what are we planting in our life? Now, I think maybe to unpack this, and, and today I want to just tell you that I'm not going to go through all this. In fact, this is a teaser. You've got to come back next week because I'm going to explain to why Jesus uses this parable next week. And then the week after that, I'm going to tell you what Jesus says this all really means. So, you know, that, that means you've got to come back. But if I could to just take you up 37,000 feet today and just look at this story on this day quickly, what do we learn about how to grow spiritually? Well, I think there's just some obvious things. You know, the first thing is, is that in order to grow, you need seed. That's the story Jesus tells of a farmer goes out and he throws seed. That may not be the way we would want to do it, but we can see in this picture uh, how this looks, what it looks like to do that. You know, you can see just throwing it out. Maybe some of you have done that before. I remember as a kid, my dad uh, wanted to plant some grass, and he got the tractor out because we grew up in the country in East Texas, and uh, he wanted to use any excuse that he could to get on the tractor. He'd get out there, and he'd till all the, all the stuff around the house, and he wanted to grow some rye grass, and he just threw it out there, and the rain came, and it just grew. It was amazing. Now, that's not the most effective agricultural method for most types of farming. We know that, but that's just what we have in this story. Jesus, I'm sure, knew other methods, but it's just this is a particular example. And I'm sure as he was saying that, I don't know if you know the geography of Israel very well, they could have turned their eyes to each side of the Sea of Galilee and they would have seen farms and fields. Maybe with freshly planted crops, or maybe with freshly harvested crops, or maybe with crops that were in full bloom and could see the product of what was taking place when you planted and when you harvested. In the Bible, this idea of of seeds and sowing is really significant because there's this idea in the Bible of sowing and reaping. There's this notion in Scripture that we, we cannot reap where we did not sow. Or put another way, if I can say it like this in this message today, you got to sow to grow. <laughs> if you want in your life to grow spiritually, let me ask you are, you, are you planting in your life spiritual things? Are you planting the right things in your life? Are you placing in your life the things that you need in order to gr- have that harvest that you would want? This is the way Paul puts it in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. He said, don't be deceived God cannot be mocked. A man, or he might as easily have said a woman, reaps what he sows or she sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. That's what Jesus is saying here, isn't it? We have the opportunity in our lives, for ourselves and others, to to sow the seed that will reap the harvest of righteousness. Right now, your life, my life, we're planting stuff. Maybe not this year, maybe next year we'll see the product of it. 
But are we, are we planting it? Parents and grandparents, as we, as we, as we sow those seeds into the, the next generation, we do it because we want to reap a harvest that will outlast us. You need seed to sow, and you need to sow to grow. Now, the other thing Jesus said is obvious in this passage is you need soil, right? You need, you need seed, you need soil. Now, let's be honest. Some of you in this room know a lot more about agriculture and horticulture than the preacher does, and you know that it's possible to grow plants without soil. And I'm sure Jesus knew that too, but he's telling a story, and the parts of the story are important. And in this particular story, when you want to plant the kind of harvest that you want to build here, you need soil. And so he describes four different types of soil, and we can put them up on the screen. I, I kind of found this graphic. I think it's a good way to see it visually. You have the path, the stony ground, the thorny ground, and the good soil. Now, all of this is so rich for the people who are experiencing this as Jesus tells the story. This, these are people who live in the land of Israel. Israel is unlike any other place in this part of the world. In fact, in the Bible, there was this guy named Abraham that God said, I'm gonna give you this land. Then his grandkids were slaves in Egypt for 430 years and they finally get to come out of it and they come to the edge of it and they sent some people in to go, hey, check it out. Let's see what this land is like. And they brought back a report. It's from Numbers 13, 27. We can tell you what they said. They gave Moses this account. They said, we went into the land in which you sent us. And it does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit. And they brought these huge clusters of grapes. Now, I just want you to know, in case you're one of these people who are kind of real literal, you're like, was there really milk rivers and honey rivers there in Israel. Yes, there was. No, I'm just kidding. There really wasn't. It's an expression, right? This is a place of such abundance. And you have to understand this part of the world geographically because to the south, you have the Egyptian desert. To the west, you have the Mediterranean Sea. To the east, you have the Jordanian Desert. This was a isolated place, but right here was a special place. This was a fertile land bridge that united all the ancient world, and it was a place of great agricultural ability and capacity. It was a place where you could have herds and crops, and the people who could live here, get this, they could live forever there, for generation to generation to generation to generation. The people who inhabited this land were inhabiting the promised land. Today we call it the holy land. And they understood how important the soil was, the good soil that they were living in. But Jesus is here not talking about soil. He's talking about the receptivity in your heart and your mind to the word that he wants you to hear today. And the question is, is when you walked in here today, what, was, what is the soil of your life? Are you the hard ground that the word can't get into or is your heart right now being softened and the good word is being sown into your life? Kind of something interesting to do might be this afternoon is go and, and read this story over in Matthew's gospel, the 13th chapter. Because after Jesus tells the parable of a sower, he then tells a parable of, wheat, of weeds. There's the parable of wheat and the parable of weeds. It's kind of interesting. And in the parable of of weeds, after he tells this story about a farmer, he goes out and plants some, he says, and then the enemy comes, a neighbor that doesn't really like you very much, and comes over there and says, you know what, I know you really wanted this bumper crop, but I'm going to plant all this stuff that's going to ruin all that, and he comes and he plants weeds in the field, and somebody comes and tells the farmer, hey, somebody did all this, they planted all this stuff, what should we do, and the farmer says, you know what, there's not much we can do, I mean, they didn't have Roundup back then, folks. So you couldn't just go out there and spray all the weeds. What do you do? This is what it says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 30. He says, let both grow together until the harvest, the wheat and the weeds. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, collect the weeds first, tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. 
Now Jesus tells that story and then he interrupts it with the story and then he comes back and he explains what it means. This is what he says in Matthew 13, 39. The enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the harvesters are angels. In other words, he, if you'll pardon this, he ain't talking about wheat and weeds. He's talking about our lives, isn't he? He's talking about the word in our life. And he's talking about an enemy who, whether we realize it right now, is trying to sow into our lives the opposite of what we should be. And while we were sleeping and while we were unaware and while everything was happening in our lives, the enemy was coming and he was planting stuff. And in this room today, I don't know the soil of your life. I don't know if you're a wheat or a weed. <laughs> I don't know. Jesus says sometimes you're a sheep or a goat. <laughs> you figure that one out, you know. But we, we are one or the other until the harvest comes and then we find out. But you know what? There's good news this morning, and that is there's still time for you. And if today you know that you aren't who and what you need to be, maybe the Lord could soften the soil of your life and the, and the, the good word could be sown into you right now. You need seed. You need soil. But then he tells something else in this story. It's kind of interesting he describes the problem of not just the soil, right? It's not just the soil that's the potential problem. It's the things that are around the soil so that, that could threaten growth, that could keep you from growing up spiritually. And so if I could put it one more way, because I'm a Baptist preacher and all of it has to start with S, you need to keep it safe. You need it safe. You know, you want the seed to be safe. You want it to be in an environment that has all the ingredients necessary to ensure growth. Can I say we need the same thing in our lives today? We need to be in an environment that, where we have every opportunity to grow spiritually. You know, COVID has really tempted a lot of us to kind of go, you know, I don't need church. I don't need each other. We don't need each other. We can just kind of, kind of bow out, check out. But you know, the truth is, we do need each other. We need to be in an environment where we can be encouraged and grow spiritually because there is a danger that lurks around us. In fact, what I want to do now is I want to just kind of, I want to kind of tell you a little bit of what Jesus means by this and kind of give you a little teaser of what I'm going to talk about in a couple of weeks. But I'm just going to jump ahead just a little bit and explain what Jesus means in his own words. This is the way Jesus describes this. Later on in this chapter in Mark, Mark 4, 18 and 19, we put the verses on the screen. Jesus will explain this whole situation about the, the seed in the soil and then the other stuff, the thorns that grows up around it. He explains what this means. He says, you know, still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word. But he ain't talking, again, about, he's not talking about seeds. He's talking about our life and us hearing the word. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but, and he starts to describe the situation, the worries of this life, and you're reading that and you're going, whew, I'm sure I'm glad there's nothing to worry about. Glad this stuff's not relevant, right? Nothing to worry about in our lives. The worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth. You know, the preacher, somebody said to the preacher one time, you went from preaching to meddling, you know, when you get to that. The deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things comes in and chokes the word. It doesn't kill it. He says it just makes it unfruitful. I'm wondering today, I mean, I don't know where you are with the Lord. Maybe you and the Lord are good, but if you look at your life, there's no fruit. You know, there's, there's a relationship, but there's, there's not anything coming out of it. And maybe what it is is that you have allowed sort of to settle into the spiritual comfort zone of life and you've become unproductive because you've allowed yourself to be distracted by a lot of other things. And he describes those things in this passage. And if you study kind of like what's going on in America right now, one of the things that's happened, if you, if you watch the Wall Street Journal, the stock market has gone up. Americans' affluence has gone up. But go read Barner Research and church has done this. There's a 
direct relationship in this country and in the Western world to the rise of affluence and the decline in spiritual interest. And you can't help but just wonder, isn't that what Jesus is saying here? Like, be careful. Be careful that we don't just get so comfortable in our situation that we allow all these weeds to sort of grow up around us and thorns to grow up around us, and we get distracted with the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth and desire for other, for other things. You know, Jesus told a story one time about this. He, it's kind of the famous story. We call it the story of the rich young ruler. But, you know, everything about this guy, he was, of course, rich, and he was a ruler, and he was righteous, and he was all that stuff. But he's really one of the saddest characters in the Bible because he comes to Jesus and he wants to have eternal life and Jesus tells him how to do it and he walks away. And this is what Jesus says in Matthew 19, 23. He said to his disciples, I tell you, truly I tell you, it's hard for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now he doesn't say it's impossible in Matthew. He doesn't say it can't be done. He says it's hard. Why would it be hard? Is, there just, is money just bad? No. It's that it can be a real distraction for us. It can be something that doesn't allow our faith to stay safe. In fact, look, listen to the way Paul describes it when he writes 1 Timothy, and he's talking to that young pastor, and he says in 1 Timothy 6, 9, those who, and it's, I think it's interesting the way he puts this, those who want to get rich fall into temptation. He doesn't actually say in that passage those who are rich. He says those who want to. The desire thing. And a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And here's one of the verses in the Bible that's most often misquoted. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. In the pursuit of the thing they desired, they discovered it was unsatisfying. They realized that the pursuit that they had chased after had left them surrounded by thorns and thistles and the productivity of their life drained of all its fruitfulness. Another way the scriptures describe this is in John where Jesus, uh, where John says famously, do not love the world or anything in the world. Every time I read that, I think, John, didn't you write a gospel where it says in 316, God so loved the world? And then I always have to remind myself, yeah, God loves people, but the world can sometimes not be a good thing. It can sometimes, it can sometimes be an unsafe place for spiritual growth, and we need a better environment. He says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And he names one, two, three, just like Jesus does in the parable when he says, the worries of the life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire of other things. Here he mentions those three things as well. Comes, he says, not from the Father, but it comes from the world. And the world and its desires They pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. What are we sowing in our lives? What kind of environment are we surrounding ourselves with spiritually? What things are we allowing to kind of grow up beside us so that they begin to choke out the effectiveness and the fruitfulness and the productivity of our Christian faith in this world? How do we grow spiritually? It's almost like we need to do something about it. Maybe we need to come in and and remove some of the things that don't need to be there. I wish there was a sermon next week the pastor was going to preach on that would talk about that. Oh, yeah, that is next week. Come back. We're going to talk about how to prune some of these things from our life. And then we're going to come back and talk about what Jesus really means about all this. But if I can just kind of wrap this up right here and now, I just want to say this. If we want to grow spiritually in our lives, we're going to have to sow spiritually into our lives. If we want to reap the kind of things that we should reap from our lives, we're going to have to sow into our lives. And to do that, you and I are going to have to allow God to make the soil of our life receptive to the word that he wants us to hear today. That's why Jesus says if you have ears, if you've got ears, Listen, just 
Just let it in. Let it in. Let the word do what the word can do in your heart and in your life right now. I want us just to take a moment and just pray about that today. Father, our lives are lived out before you. And my prayer for each one of us in this room and those watching right now, that God, that our life could be the softened ground, the broken ground that allows the word to enter. Lord, I pray that our lives can be ones in which we hold back the distractions so that we have opportunity for things to grow in us spiritually as they should. Father, I just pray this this morning for all of us who have people in our lives, whether our children or grandchildren, that we have a responsibility to pour into their lives, to sow into their lives spiritual things, God, that we will not miss the opportunity to do that. Father, I'm grateful today. I, I thought of this all week, Lord. I'm so grateful for the people who've done that in my life people who've taken their time and their talent and their energy and they've poured into me and God I'm grateful for them and I pray that that many of us could rise up to be sowers in the lives of other people and I pray Lord that we would see the harvest of that as well but right now God I just pray for someone someone whose hardened ground has just resisted for a long time the good news of Jesus, the hope of salvation and eternal life, that right now their heart would be softened and they would take and they would receive this word in Jesus' name. Amen.